The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, Romans chapter 10 and verse 4. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with today's message entitled, Change of Administration. Through the Lord Jesus Christ we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. We pray thee that thy word may go forth in this hour, in the divine power, that our faith may not stand in the wisdom of men, but in thy power, O God, use it to thy glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are studying in our studies in the epistle to the Romans in the tenth chapter and the fourth verse. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. Now this very important verse has had a variety of interpretations, generally depending on what the reader wanted to find there to bolster his own preconceived opinions. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. What does this verse mean? Now in order to find out, we must proceed by a process of elimination. One of the most remarkable misinterpretations is that of A.T. Robertson, who certainly was one of the greatest Greek scholars of all history. This fundamental Southern Baptist has written, amazingly, that, quote, Christ put a stop to the law as a means of salvation, unquote. Now, surely he knew that the law had never been a means of salvation. The work of his entire life was against such an idea as that which he has suggested in his comment on our text. Perhaps he was misled by Denny, who evidently made the same mistake as Robertson uses his name without quoting him to express the thought that here Paul's main idea is that Christ ended the law as a method of salvation for everyone that believeth, whether Jew or Gentile. Christ wrote finis on law as a means of grace. Now let's face it. Law never was a means of salvation. Law never was a means of grace. The law, the law of Moses, the law was given that every mouth might be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. Now we've covered this so fully when we studied Romans 3.19 that we do not need to enlarge upon it here. So the meaning of the word telos, the end, depends always on the context. The end of life is its termination. The end of troubles is their transformation. The end of a promise is its fulfillment. The end of our faith is the salvation of our souls, as we read in 1 Peter 1, 9. Now, what is the end of the law? And our text says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. As I pondered deeply over the meaning of this text, I began to think of it as it affected me personally. I am included in the last line of the text, for I am a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in the strongest definition of the word believe, I am to be included. I believe with my intellect that the Lord Jesus Christ was here upon this earth as a historical character. I believe that he passed through the experiences that are described in the four Gospels. I believe that wicked men took him and nailed him to a cross and that Jesus hung there and died. I believe that his body was placed in a tomb and remained there for three days and nights. I believe that on the third day the Lord God Almighty raised him from the dead and that his spirit and soul came back into that same body that died and that Christ made himself known to his disciples. I believe that this same Christ, body, soul, and spirit, ascended into heaven to take his place on the throne of the Father. All this I believe. I believe it with my intellect. But in addition... I must be accounted as a believer because I believe that all of these things had a divine and a spiritual meaning. This rises out of my belief in Christ's identity. Who was he? That's the most important question that you will ever have to face. I believe that the death which Jesus accomplished when he died upon the cross was part of an agreement between the Father and himself whereby my sins were put upon Jesus as my Savior, and his righteousness was put to my account by the Father. All of this I believe not only with my intellect,
but with my whole being. Yet, I am not to be counted as a mere intellectual believer or as one whose relationship is that of dogmatic credulity. I find it difficult to express, but I, I know that I am a believer in the sense of having made a full commitment of myself to Christ, so that I, who am nothing apart from him, may realize his fullness. And thus, my belief must become operational in my life, so that I am seeking to be yielded to Christ in such a way that my voice shall carry the tone of his voice, that my hands may touch people with his compassion, that my life shall show forth his life, and that the fruits of his presence in me shall manifest love, and joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control. Now, in the light of all this, it can be seen that I certainly am included in that last line of our text. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to, to everyone that believeth. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for me. Now, the sinner who lived under the law of Moses had strivings that could not be fulfilled. The man who lived four or five hundred years before Christ in the time of David and Solomon, he had strivings that could not be fulfilled. But the man who knows the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior finds that he can enter into the rest, the peace that was provided by Christ. The central section of the epistle to the Hebrews sets forth these truths in such a way that it might be considered that the writer to the Hebrews had taken our text as a point of departure. Listen to these words. I'm quoting from Hebrews 7. Quite plainly then, there is a definite cancellation of the previous commandment because of its ineffectiveness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. It was incapable of bringing anyone to real maturity. But the bringing in of a better hope did and it is Christ, this better hope, who is the end of the law, the end of its methods, the end of its priesthood, the end of its purpose, who is made unto us righteousness, and who brings us to this better hope. Now it's evident, therefore, that with Christ, with the coming of Christ, there was a complete change of administration that introduced new principles and methods. The change from Old Testament times and methods to those which are enforced today was a far greater change than that which was accomplished in the field of government when our land stopped being a dominion that was a colony of England and became a free republic responsible to the people. Now this change from Old Testament to New Testament times is illustrated in the book of Hebrews by a comparison between two orders of priesthood. Every Jew was familiar with the priesthood of Aaron. It was the priesthood which governed the religious life of Israel. One of the priests of the tribe of Levi offered the morning and the evening sacrifice every day in the year. The priests were headed by a man who bore the title of high priest. The Old Testament contained whole books that had to do with the foundation of this priesthood and the maintenance of its work. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are filled with details concerning the consecration and service of these earthly priests. Suddenly, the New Testament announces that this priesthood is to be abolished. And that's why we who are evangelicals and who go to the New Testament alone for our faith, that is why we are not called priests. For the New Testament announces that the priesthood that was in the Old Testament was to be abolished. At the moment Christ died, the great curtain in the temple which separated the holy place from the holiest of all was torn in two from top to bottom. As there was an earthquake at the moment in which Jesus Christ died, and God announced that he was through with priesthood and liturgical service. A few years later, God saw to it that the prophecy which had been made by Jesus Christ was fulfilled and that the Jewish temple itself was destroyed by the Romans. 
to the extent that not one stone was left upon another. Still later in the providence of God, Mohammedanism captured the land of Israel and built its mosque on the very spot where the tabernacle and the temple of Israel had stood. And that building, the mosque of Omar, stands there today, making it impossible for any member of the people that had the covenant with God to approach the one place where the Mosaic sacrifices could be fulfilled. The first time I ever went to Palestine, I saw that unforgettable scene of the scores of elderly Jews beating their heads against the wailing wall at the foot of the place where the mosque was far above them and where they could never enter. It was a sad sight, but one which fulfilled all the prophecies of the Old Testament. Now, at the same time that Jesus Christ came into the world, God announced that he, Christ, was a priest, but not a priest after the order of Aaron, Levi, but a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Let us look at this man, Melchizedek, for a moment. If you were reading the Bible for the first time, you would discover that at the very beginning in the book of Genesis, longer and longer paragraphs were given to the characters as they are introduced on the first pages of Scripture. Adam has a brief notice, then Enoch. A longer paragraph is given to Noah, and still more space is devoted to Abraham. The uninformed reader might well draw the conclusion that with Abraham, he had reached the, the central figure of the book, and that the plot would revolve around him. In a spiritual sense, this is true, for Abraham is the most important human character in the Bible, far more important than Moses, Aaron, or Paul. But suddenly, however, in the story of Genesis, Abraham comes home after winning a battle against several kings who had made an alliance between themselves. And as Abraham is on his way home, he's met by a strange figure who appears out of nowhere and, after a moment, disappears into nowhere. The brief interval in which this figure appears shows him as greater, as superior to Abraham. The name of this figure is not given. He's merely called by two titles, King of Righteousness and King of Peace. Now, the Hebrew words for King of Righteousness give us what commonly passes for the name, Melchizedek, Melchizedek. And this man, this being, uh, without a recorded past or recorded future, sets out bread and wine, the communion elements, and Abraham gets down on his knees in front of this man and partakes of this food. And Abraham then divides all the spoil that he had won in battle, divides it into ten parts, and gives one of these ten parts to this man, Melchizedek. Now the New Testament appraises this standing figure of Melchizedek, who is giving his blessing to the kneeling figure, Abraham. And in Hebrews 7, 7, it says, And no one can deny that the receiver of a blessing is inferior to the one who gives it. Now the uninformed reader will be forced to think that here is a character that will play a great part in the development of the Bible revelation, where when we see Abraham down on his knees in front of Melchizedek, we think, well, here is indeed a superior character. But then as the story unfolds in Genesis, there is no further mention of Melchizedek. He's not to be found in the remainder of the Mosaic writings. He's, his name is not mentioned throughout the whole history of Israel. He's not found in the prophets. There is one cryptic sentence in the Psalms which says, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. But by this time, the casual reader would have forgotten Genesis and would place the Psalms in the, the company of the hundreds of other passages which cannot be understood on the first or on the hundred and first reading of the Bible. Then, coming to the New Testament, the reader would find no further mention of Melchizedek in the four Gospels, in the Acts, or in the epistles of Paul. Then suddenly, in the epistle of the Hebrews, we find several chapters written about this character. He is, in no small sense, the key to the understanding of the whole Bible. As a Bible teacher, I make bold to state that if the relationship of the two priesthoods, 
that of Aaron and Melchizedek, if this relationship is understood, the Bible will be understood. And that if the relationship of these two priesthoods is not understood, the Bible will not be understood. So let us then clarify the situation simply. Israel had operated under the law of Moses throughout the 15 centuries between the giving of the law and the coming of Christ. Now this was by the order and the plan of God. When we come to the New Testament, we discover that the Old Testament was an object lesson, a temporary picture of that which was to be permanent. The Old Testament was the shadow of something that was to be substance. The New Testament, in its relationship to the Old Testament, might be summarized to say, instead of the temple, it's to be Christ. Instead of Moses, Christ. Instead of Aaron, Christ. Instead of the law, Christ. Instead of ceremonies, Christ. Instead of a worship localized in a building, there is to be the eternal, omnipresent Christ. Melchizedek was to represent eternity, as well as eternity can be represented in time. A man appears out of nowhere and disappears into nowhere. And in the brief moment of his appearance, Abraham gets down on his knees in front of him. And when Abraham was on his knees, all his unborn children were in his loins, and they were on their knees before this unknown eternal figure. This included Abraham's son Isaac, his grandson Jacob, and his great-grandson Levi. Levi included his son Aaron, and Aaron included all the priests who should ever come from the tribe of Levi. And therefore, the whole religious life of Israel was on its knees to the man who appeared in front of Abraham. And this, says the New Testament, was a pageant of Jesus Christ. Here we have one who is quite independent of Levitic ancestry, taking a tenth from Abraham and giving a blessing to Abraham, the holder of God's promises and a partner in the covenant that God had made to Christ and him, as we read in Galatians 3.16. One might say, we read in Hebrews, one might say that even Levi, the proper receiver of tenths, has paid his tenth to this man, for in a sense he already existed in the body of his father Abraham when Melchizedek met him. We may go even further. If it be possible to bring men to spiritual maturity through the Levitical priestly system, for that is the system under which the people were given the law, why does the necessity arise for another priest to make his appearance after the order of Melchizedek instead of following the normal priestly calling of Aaron? For if there is a transference of priestly powers, there will necessarily follow an alteration of the law regarding priesthood. Christ, who is described as our high priest, belongs to another tribe, no member of which had ever attended the altar. For it is a matter of history that our Lord Jesus was a descendant of Judah, and Moses made no mention of priesthood in connection with that tribe. How fundamental is this change becomes all the more apparent when we see this other priest appearing according to the Melchizedek pattern and deriving his priesthood, not by virtue of a command imposed from outside, but from the power of indestructible life within. Quite plainly, then, there is a definite cancellation of the previous commandment because of its ineffectiveness and uselessness. So, our text in Romans, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. It is a trumpet shout of triumph that a revolution has taken place and that an entirely new manner of life has been set before men by God. I go back to the illustration of human law and government. The colonists in America felt themselves aggrieved under the colonial administration from England. A great revolution took place. There was war. George Washington led the movement to destroy colonial power and establish an entirely new government based on a new constitution. 
Now, we might say that Washington was the end of the law for government to everyone abiding in the colonies. So we may understand that Christ was the end of the Mosaic law and all its bondage in order to bring in the New Testament as an entirely different constitution from which true liberties could flow in the lives of those who believe and that the righteousness of God which he wished to make effective in the lives of men might be made available under the new conditions of the risen Christ coming to live his life in the heart of those whom he has redeemed and in whom he is working out his purposes. I am therefore no more under the law of Moses as a Christian than I am under the government of England as an American citizen. There has been a revolution. Christ has died. Yes, he's risen again and he lives. It can readily be seen that the fact that I am delivered from the government of England does not mean that I am no longer governed, but rather that I am governed by a new constitution, the American constitution. And the fact that I am delivered from the law of Moses does not mean that I am lawless, but that I have an allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the very righteousness of God and that this righteousness shall flow throughout my life and abound because he is the spring of all righteousness and has established a freely flowing spring of righteousness within my being. We can praise God for the deliverance and we can praise God for the new life. And our God and Father, we pray thee that the Holy Spirit shall take the message to many hearts this day and those that are under the bondage of trying and trying and trying to live right may learn that they no longer have to try, but that they may commit themselves to Christ and that he will come in the heart and furnish the power for victory and life and joy and peace. Bless each listening heart in this hour. We ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.